let's begin by praying. Father God, we thank you that you are a speaking God. We thank you that you have spoken to us clearly uh, through your word. Father, the desire of our hearts is not just to know more about you and what you've said, but um, Father, we desire to change. And I pray uh, by your Holy Spirit that you would change us, that we will hear these words and put them into practice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. COVID was quite slow to get to Bolivia. COVID was raging all around the world, or at least in Italy and Spain and some other parts, before we even had one case in Bolivia. But in March of 2020, when that first case was discovered, schools immediately locked down, the borders were closed, and uh, shopping and going to banks and all those kinds of things, football that you would normally do, were drastically restricted. It all happened so quickly. And then, all of a sudden, we were stuck. We really couldn't leave Bolivia. There was no way out of Bolivia. And so as Kate and I uh, processed that situation, as we thought about what that meant for our family and for our ministry, um, we got a surprising email from the Honorary Consul of Australia in La Paz. Um, And that email said, A bus had been organised by the Australian government to go around all the Bolivian cities picking up stranded travellers and driving them all to the airport in La Paz where they would then be flown to Santiago and then to Sydney. And that bus would come to the house within 72 hours and we had just 24 hours to tell the consul whether we wished to take that bus or not. And so we had to make a decision. We had a decision to make. We had to, we had to choose between leaving Bolivia in just three days with no possibility of saying goodbye, just leaving all of a house full of things disordered and um, getting on an aeroplane and flying away, closing a chapter of our lives that had begun way back in 2005 when we began studying at SMBC. Or we could stay in Bolivia. We, could, um, we would be far away from our families with no clear path back to Australia and we would face the consequences of the pandemic in a country that was totally um, ill-equipped just simply did not have the health system required to deal properly with that crisis. It was a terrible decision that we had to make. Um, Both options, whichever option we chose, would have had quite drastic impacts on our well-being and possibly on our health. Um, It was a really difficult decision. And so as um, we sought Christian counsel and we prayed about it, But as we processed that decision, I think that it was difficult because the COVID pandemic, COVID destroys the illusion that life is predictable. COVID destroys the illusion that life will always be just as we want it. COVID is a constant reminder that we are vulnerable. On the surface, we had to decide whether to stay or to go. But behind that decision was a much bigger question, which was this. How could we respond to the uncertainty of life without falling into despair? How could we process the uncertainty of life without falling into despair? Now, we processed that question as a family. We prayed about it as a family of six, and as we... Um, I tried to decide what to do, a kind pastor from Bowral Baptist, Marcus Wright, who uh, many of you would know, he reached out to us and he shared with us the scripture um, that was read tonight. He shared that passage with us um, and we, that passage was a great comfort to us um, during this time in our lives. And so, um, in the end, we did not take that bus. It was simply too difficult. It wasn't possible for us to be ready to leave Bolivia in that time frame. Um, um, in the months that followed, it was probably five, 
um, perhaps five months later, we were able to finally leave. But during the next five months, these verses were a constant um, comfort to me. Now, in the verses that were read, Jesus has gathered his disciples together and he's giving them a lesson on how to process the uncertainty of life. He's giving them a lesson in how to process uncer the uncertainty of life with hope. Now, if we think about who the disciples were, they were a group of men living 2,000 years ago in ancient Jerusalem, and we can't know for certain, but our best guess is that um, life expectancy in that time was about 35 years. Now, that life, they think that that life expectancy would have been dragged down by a very high sort of infant mortality rate, but basically people would not have expected to live all that long. And the reasons are kind of obvious if you think about it. It was a, it was a time of very poor levels of sanitation. Um, there were very primitive um, medical techniques available, available to people. They were highly susceptible to disease and illness. Wars were frequent. Um, the Romans at that time, uh, it was nothing for them to publicly execute people. A bad harvest could result in food shortages, which would lead to famine and then starvation. Um, the disciples were just fishermen. They were fishing in an era where there was no refrigeration. And so they would just fish, and the fish, they, then they would have a very short period of time with which to sell their fish in a marketplace. They really did live from day to day. Life in Jerusalem for the disciples was difficult. It was hard. There were many risks to life and health. The disciples actually had plenty of things to worry about. There was a lot that could go wrong. And so how would Jesus teach his disciples to face the uncertainty of life but maintain hope? Now, from the passage that was read this evening, I'd just like to take three points. We'll just make three points and... Um, really, there's three key commands of Jesus in this passage, one that affects our heads, one that affects our hearts, and one that affects our hands. And so we'll start here. Jesus' first command to his disciples concerned their heads. Jesus says, do not worry because God is good and he cares for you. Jesus tells his disciples to use the brains in their heads and to remember that God is good. Now, Jesus calls his disciples' attention. He calls his disciples' attention to nature. He observes that small birds live each day, eating only what they can find. These birds, they have no possibility for producing food themselves. They certainly can't store it up. They have no strategy for preserving life. They have no life insurance policy. But God cares for them just the same. And then God, then Jesus rather, calls the disciples' attention to the flowers. He says, look how beautiful those flowers are. Flowers are more beautiful even than the most expensive clothes. Probably lots of us have come here with floral decorations on, you know, the clothes that we're wearing. I have them all over my mask. Flowers are very beautiful. But when you think about it, they're cut and they're put in a vase and they're appreciated for a week and then they're discarded and thrown away. Jesus says that if God loves and cares so much, even for his common creation, just birds and flowers, how much more will he care for people? People are the high point of God's creation. They're the pinnacle of creation. Genesis tells us that humans alone are made in God's image, and it's to humans that God gave the responsibility to care for and order creation. And so, Jesus' point is if God cares even just for the very ordinary things like tiny birds and flowers, if he cares for those and loves them, how much more will he love people? The human temptation, however, is to think not about God's goodness and faithfulness. The human temptation is to think about the bad things that might happen. We, are, we get stressed about what may or may not happen in the future. And this is really the opposite this is the opposite of what Jesus is telling his disciples to do. The opposite of remembering that God is good is really to stress about what might happen in the future. So Jesus asks his disciples, what good is it really to worry? What do you achieve by imagining the worst? And then it's really a rhetorical question. Jesus answers his own question. 
He says, worry cannot even add one moment to your life. Worry can't add one second even to your life. In other words, worry is useless. Worry is a way of disbelieving God's goodness. Worry denies the very faithfulness of God. Isn't it true that what we believe about the future really does have an impact in the way that we act and behave in the present? If we believe, if we believe in our hearts, if we strongly believe that God is good and faithful, we really don't have a reason to be very worried about the future. But if we believe that God is not good, if we don't have a belief that God is faithful, then we do have a reason to worry about all kinds of things and to cling desperately on to what we have, to cling on to those things. I'm certain if we were to stop right now and just reflect on our own lives for a minute, we would remember um, very extravagant and kind acts of God in our lives. Um, This is something that even small children can do. Um, I asked my children recently, I asked my children recently, how, how could, when you think about your own lives, um, in what ways can you see that God has been kind and faithful to you? And so my daughter Poppy has given me uh, permission to share this story with you. Poppy said that when she arrived in Bolivia for our second term of service, if you like, it was after a period of three years in Australia, we plucked, in 2018, we plucked our kids out of school at Windsor Public and we put them into Despertad in Bolivia, in Cochabamba, and especially Pat and Poppy, they had forgotten all of their Spanish. They couldn't remember any of their Spanish. And you could imagine how difficult that is for a child to move from a context in which they can communicate clearly, in which they're understood and um, can make themselves understood and put them into a context where they simply can't communicate. It was a deeply stressful period for her. And during that time, there was one girl from an English family not a Christian family, and she did make friends with Poppy, but her influence wasn't uh, entirely positive. And so we were really praying that God would provide for Poppy a Christian friend. You know, by the time that we left Bolivia, we left in August of 2020, Poppy said to us she had never had such good friends in her whole life as she had then. And God had marvelously provided for her a Christian girl, a girl called Annabella, um, who she counts among um, her closest friends still to this day. In Poppy's moment of difficulty, in Poppy's moment of um, sadness and struggle, God provided for her in the very most kind and wonderful way. When we face uncertainty, and the world as we know it is very uncertain, When we face uncertainty, Jesus tells us to use our brains, to use the brains that he has put in our heads and remember that God is good and God is faithful and that God cares for us. Now, the second command that Jesus gives his disciples in this passage concerns their hearts. Jesus says to the disciples, do not be afraid, do not worry, seek God's kingdom, seek the kingdom of God. Jesus tells his disciples not to worry about what they will eat or drink. He says, don't worry about the things of this world. They are transitory, passing things. Jesus says, do not set your hearts on accumulating assets. Do not set your hearts on climbing up the the ladder of importance in your company. Do not set your heart on being popular. Jesus says the disciples, the priority for the disciples is not fame or prestige or comfort or success or making sales or going on holidays. Really, a pandemic can take all of those things away. Hoping in the transitory things of the world actually multiplies our worry because it is always possible to lose them. And trusting in uncertain things very naturally results in worry. It is the most logical thing to do. If you trust and hope in something that at any moment may be taken from you, then worry is the most logical response. Jesus instead tells his disciples to seek God's kingdom, to reorient their hearts toward what what God is doing among them. Now, the kingdom of God, it's kind of a, a, it's a big concept It's not a place, and it's not a philosophy, but the kingdom of God really begins with a person. 
Now, these are things that we all know very well. We know them from memory. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born in humility and during, in, in a stable with animals. And during his very short life, we know that Jesus taught with authority like no one else had ever taught before. We know in Jesus' short life, he loved people like no one had ever loved them before. And we know that in Jesus' short life on earth, he was tempted in every way, but never sinned once. Jesus perfectly obeyed God's law without ever sinning. Now, some people that were around Jesus, they could see that he was different. They could see that God was doing something extraordinary through him, but many couldn't. And the religious leaders of that time, they were very jealous of Jesus. They put him on a cross and they crucified him and they thought with that that they had won. But of course, Jesus, by his horrible death, actually paid the penalty for sins. And Jesus, when he spectacularly rose from the dead after three days, he guaranteed eternal life for all people who repent before him. Through Jesus, light shines in this very dark world. Through Jesus, all people can have a personal relationship with God. And so whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. It is these people that by faith and belief come into God's kingdom. And when by faith and belief we come into God's kingdom, we receive these very most wonderful promises the people who are in the kingdom of God, they they experience the relief of forgiveness, even though they sin. They have the hope of eternal life, even though they die. They know that God works good out of all situations, even when on the surface it seems like everything is going wrong. They are consoled by Jesus, even when they're sad. And they have the promise of an eternal dwelling in the Father's house, even though they are totally priced out of the housing market in Australia. Jesus says, don't worry about the things of this earth. Your priority is the kingdom. Set your hearts on what God is doing through Jesus. And that's calling people to himself, calling people to a whole new countercultural life of faith, hope and love. Jesus says to his disciples, seek the kingdom. That is your priority. Um, That should be the desire of your heart. Shortly after returning to Bolivia in 2018, we were able to obtain Bolivian citizenship. Now, that was on the basis of having children born in Bolivia, having lived, lived with permanent residency for a long time in Bolivia. And so after we passed the knowledge test, after we were able to show that we could sing the national anthem, um, we were able to come into citizenship um, in Bolivia. Now, once you are a citizen of Bolivia, you enjoy the privileges of Bolivian citizenship. There are national privileges associated with being a citizen. So, for example, before the pandemic hit in right at the, well, right at the beginning of 2020 last year, we were able to, the year before last year, we were able to drive our car across the border into Chile and then down into Argentina and then on the way back through Uruguay and then back into Bolivia. And as we crossed all of those borders, we did not have to show a passport because when Bolivian citizens are all issued with a Bolivian identity card, and so with that Bolivian identity card, you have free passage across all the borders of the South American countries. So as Bolivian citizens, we could pass freely from one country to another. We didn't have to pay any taxes. If an Australian citizen was to try and cross those borders, there would be all kinds of reciprocity fees and taxes that they would have to pay. But as Bolivian citizens, we enjoyed the benefits of Bolivian citizenship. At the end of 2019, there were elections in Bolivia, presidential elections. And for the first time in our lives in Bolivia, we were able to vote. Our vote would count. And so we paid attention to the, poli- to the political scene in Bolivia in a way that we never had before during those um, 10 or more years in Bolivia. Now, we really earnestly desired the prosperity of Bolivia. And so um, the democratic right to vote becomes very important. We now had a say in the direction that that country would take. And because we valued um, We loved Bolivia and wanted to see Bolivia do well. We took that responsibility very seriously. 
And so perhaps this serves as an illustration in just a small way of what being in God's kingdom might be like. There are great blessings attached to being in the kingdom of God. There are great blessings. But the people who are in God's kingdom also desire with their hearts, they earnestly desire the good of that kingdom. Um, Being concerned for the kingdom of God, for the growth of God's kingdom, that is the desire of the heart of the disciples. That's what Jesus said to them. In the kingdom of God, people receive a new identity. Through faith and belief, people become forgiven sinners. They become servants of God and disciples of Jesus. They look out for the needs of others over their own. They share together a common purpose, which is an incredible blessing. They have the common purpose of telling other people the good news about Jesus. Jesus says to his disciples in this passage, do not worry. Don't set your hearts on the things that will pass away. Instead, set your hearts on God's kingdom. That is something that can never be taken away from you. The third command that Jesus gives his disciples in this passage concerns their hands. Jesus says, do not worry, give generously to those in need. Give generously to those in need. Jesus doesn't just give a command to share what we have. Jesus really is offering a, a totally new and alternative way of living. In the kingdom of God, we don't say, What about me? It isn't fair. I've had enough, now I want my share. As is said in that famous moving pictures song. In the kingdom of God, disciples of Jesus don't say, I could just be happy if only I had, and fill in the gap. Instead, Jesus tells his disciples to give generously. According to Jesus, Living generously, or um, well, I should say, according to Jesus, uncertainty, living in uncertain times is no impediment to generosity. The point is not that the disciples take vows of poverty like the ancient monastic orders, but the disciples are characterized by generosity. When disciples stop worrying about their own situation, they are free, they are liberated to treat other people with a spirit of generosity. They are free to look out for the welfare, to the well-being of others. During the last weeks that we were living in Bolivia, or the last months really, during the last months, my there was an elderly couple that lived over our back fence. Now, in Bolivia, the houses are all separated by quite large fences, so we probably had an eight-foot fence, an eight-foot brick fence that separated our house from the house behind. And so my kids took to writing letters to the elderly retired couple. They would write a letter, they would fold it up in the shape of an aeroplane, and they would send it over the back fence. Now. This really charmed the um, retired couple behind, and so they took to replying in the same way. They would write these letters to my kids, they would fold them up in aeroplanes, and they would send them back over the fence. And so often we would wake up in the morning and we would see on the, there was just a very small little back patio, and we would see a letter. And so this went on for a couple of weeks, and so, you know, it led to all kinds of kind of awkward conversations over that back fence. It always required that someone was on a ladder or some way of looking over. And as time went on, they went from exchanging letters to exchanging baked goods. We baked Australian things, and they baked Bolivian things, and we swapped them with each other. The generosity of spirit of my kids opened up here opportunities for friendship. Generosity is a spirit, and the currency of generosity is very often not money. It's very often not financial. You don't have to be rich to be generous. Generosity is a spirit that characterizes the life of the disciple. What Jesus is saying in this passage is the person who receives the indestructible, eternal blessings of the kingdom, like eternal life, like the forgiveness of sins, should have no difficulty at all in giving away what is temporary and transitory so transitory, like money and time and energy and goods and things. 
In the kingdom of God, we have a life that we can share that will never run out. Now, generosity is something that we do with our hands. Generosity is a letter, it's a note, a card, a phone call, it's a gift. Generosity is really limited only by your own imagination. It may even include radical gifts of um, radical financial gifts of money and assets. Jesus says to his disciples, give generously to those who are in need. In our own families, in our own neighborhoods, in our city, in our country, in the world, there are no end of people that are in great need. There are no end of people around us who are in difficulty. Do we care enough to find out who they are? Do we care enough to find out what it is that people lack? Our use of money and the spirit with which we treat other people say a great deal about the state of our hearts. Now, Jesus' words in this passage really prompt us to evaluate our own lives. Do our heads, hearts, and hands line up with the commands of Jesus? Or do we face uncertainty with fear, clinging on to the things that we have as if they may at any moment be taken away from us? What is our greatest fear as this new wave of Omicron sweeps across our country? What is our greatest fear? Is it our health? Is it that we, this, the, there may be economic difficulties associated with the pandemic that may cause us to lose our jobs? Is it being separated from our family? All kinds of lockdowns are in, the, in um, nursing homes. We can't, this is a pandemic that separates us from family, especially if we have family living overseas. Perhaps our greatest fear is simply that life will not always be as we hope it will be. It's just that we know that life is changing and it makes us feel uncomfortable. We like the way that it was before. The pandemic has a way of exposing what our hopes are. The pandemic exposes our false hopes and really makes us ask the question, what is really important to us? This is a really good question to be asking ourselves because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <clears throat> We've seen in the passage that Jesus gives three very clear commands to his disciples. He says to his disciples, don't worry with your head, remember that God is good. Jesus says to his disciples, don't worry with your heart, seek God's kingdom. And Jesus says, don't worry, with your hands, give generously to those in need. So just to finish this evening, I would like to suggest just a few ways that we could practically um, put this passage into practice in our lives. And I think this, is a, this passage is especially relevant to us as we are right now riding the Omicron wave. I'm going to fly through these very quickly. And I've tried to pick out applications that apply to our head, to our hearts, and to our hands. So we could use our heads to meditate on a psalm about God's protection and faithfulness. Now, the best way to personally own truth from the Bible is to memorize it. Then it will be always accessible to your mind and to your spirit. Good psalms to memorize could be Psalm 1 or Psalm 23 or Psalm 121, or Psalm 139. It may be that you already have some of these psalms um, nailed away to memory. Before many of us Christians, we have the practice and the habit of giving thanks to God for our food before we eat. It's a way of acknowledging that all good things come from God. Something that our family has often done is, we, before we say grace, we go around the table and in just of the very shortest time, in just a few seconds, each one of us shares a motive for being thankful. It's something that even children can participate in. It's very short, but it's wonderfully uplifting. It's wonderfully uplifting to hear each person in the family say something that they are thankful to God for, perhaps in that day or in that week or in general. Perhaps reflecting on this passage, you could ask yourself the question, what is God doing in my life right now? It's a weighty question. It might be worth taking a pen 
and paper and writing down what is God doing in my life right now. Ask yourself, how can I grow in my faith or how am I growing in my faith? As the world changes around us, it's a really good time in life for a really deep heart reflection. Following Jesus is not just a hobby, it's not just one interest amongst the many interests that we have. Following Jesus is what we do with the whole of our hearts. Well, what about this? Think about the last time that you got really angry or really sad or really emotional or really disappointed. Behind strong expressions of emotion, very often there is a deep personal fear. What triggered you the last time that you responded really emotionally? What triggered you and why? Sometimes it's hard to know why we feel the way that we do, but sometimes it's crystal clear. There is something that we want and we're not getting it. Or there is something that we don't want and we are getting it. And very often, very often, the desires of our hearts are not in themselves bad. It may be... It may be that the, you just desire to have health in itself is a good thing, but when, we desi- when the desires of our heart become inordinate, when the desires of our heart exceed our desire for God and His kingdom, then we have a problem. And very often behind those emotional reactions, there is a fear. We want respect, we're not getting it. We want to be valued, we feel undervalued. As we read through Scripture, we find the antidote to our fears. Think about what your fear is and how the Bible personally addresses that fear. Or, who do you know that is doing it tough right now and how can you support them? Quite remarkably, the Australian economy right now is actually doing very well. It's growing, employment is high, but not everybody is doing well. Who can you think in your life? Who is it in your life that might need a hand? How is it that you could reach out and personally help someone? Listen to Jesus and give generously. If you really can't think of anyone to help, just take even a five-minute look at the webpage for Australian Baptist World Aid. You'll find all kinds of incredible projects that um, our Baptist World Aid organisation is working on. How can your hands be employed in the welfare of others? And lastly, maybe you could just pick up your phone and call someone or send them a message. You could break the silence and reach out to somebody who's feeling lonely. Um, Just just a couple of months ago, I was reading on the webpage for the Centre for Public Christianity. There was a an article talking about the loneliness pandemic in our country, and it was quoting a study done by Telstra and a number of other um, kind of social work organisations, and they reported um, during the pandemic last year in 2021, 40% of Australians said they were more lonely than they had been at any other point in their lives. That's an amazing statistic, don't you think? 40% of Australians said they were more lonely than they had been at any other point in their lives. And 25% of people in that survey said they had no one with whom they could regularly talk to. Followers of Jesus have loads of life and spirit to share with others. And the currency of generosity very often is not money. This is a passage that brought me great comfort in, during 2020 as we really processed um, living in a developing world country with no possibility, no obvious possibility of being able to return to our country. And I have to confess that there was times during that time that I felt quite fearful. And I think during those moments, this passage brought great comfort to me. I think this passage marvelously switched my eyes from my own circumstances back to our Lord and Saviour Jesus. This passage switched my eyes from my own circumstances to the circumstances of others around me. And when I started asking the question, who is it in my, in my close surrounds that needs assistance, it became obvious very quickly there was so many people around, people on our street that were out of work in that very strict lockdown, There were all kinds of people that were doing it really tough. 
Jesus' words in Luke 12 spoke directly and personally into the life circumstances of 12 disciples who lived 2,000 years ago, but Jesus' words speak with equal relevance. They speak equally directly to us right now, um, living 2,000 years later. I just want to finish this evening with this detail. Um, In verse 32, Jesus refers to his disciples as my little flock. It's the only time in the whole of the New Testament that that phrase occurs, my little flock. It's really a phrase that demonstrates the great love and tenderness of Jesus. To Jesus, his disciples are just a little flock. He knows them all by name. He cares tenderly and intimately for the details of the lives of those who are following him. Jesus is the great shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd who knows each of his sheep by name. He knows each of his sheep by name and he loves them. In the face of this Omicron wave that maybe even hasn't got to its peak yet, we can rest in the truth that God is still good and he cares for us. Let's not worry about what might happen. Let's not, happen about, let's not worry about what we might lose in an earthly sense because God has given us his kingdom. God has given us indestructible promises that can never be taken from us. And let's not worry about what we might lose because God, well, Jesus has told us instead to be generous to those around us. Jesus has instead told us to be generous uh, to those who are in need. Let's pray. Wonderful Jesus, we take great comfort in your words this evening. We thank you, Jesus, for your wonderful promises. We thank you. Um, We thank you for your death on a cross that guarantees our forgiveness and for your resurrection that gives us eternal life. We give you thanks for this marvel, this mystery, this incredible blessing that we are part of your kingdom. We are your disciples. We thank you for the wonderful promises that you have given us. And I pray, uh, wonderful Jesus, that those promises uh, would be in the forefront of our minds and that we would cling to them with all of our hearts. I pray, Jesus, that you would help us not to be distracted by the things that are going on around us and not be tempted to trust in the transitory things of the world that at any moment we might lose. I pray, wonderful Jesus, that you would give us hearts of generosity to share this wonderful message um, with other people, to give generously um, from the things that you have entrusted to us. And it's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.